My, I'm Martin Wolf from the Financial Times. We, the panel is on called All Change, What Next for Monetary Policy? And we're going to take that headline uh, title in a slightly more sensible direction. Uh, but we will be clear what we're going to do. Um, before I start, let me introduce the panellist. Panelists, uh, so to my right is Laura Alfaro, uh, Warren Alpert Professor at the Harvard Business School. Uh, to her right is Mark Carney, who is now the United Nations Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance, but has uh, been governor of both the Bank of England and the Bank of Canada, which is, I think, Initiative. Unique, as far as I know. Yeah. I've been trying to find out whether anybody else has been the <laughs> head of two completely different central banks. Um, the, uh, presumably in the ECB, there must have been some overlaps. Uh, the, um, to my left is uh, uh, Thomas Jordan, who's chairman of the governing board of the Swiss National Bank, which in terms of inflation performance is surely the best in the world <laughs> uh, sure. uh, for decades. Uh, to his left is Julio Velade, who's governor of the Central Bank of Peru. And uh, to his left is Catherine Garrett Cox, chief executive officer, uh, asset management at the Gulf International Bank. So a nice wide uh, uh, panel with a nice broad range of experiences. And it's pretty obvious why we will be addressing this, um, because we've just gone through uh, a pretty big inflationary shock, um, not, to put it mildly, wild, widely expected, uh, and we are still in the process of getting un it under control. And that has raised, obviously, lots of questions about was this a monetary policy or other policy mistake, or was it just a series of shocks, and how does that interact, and what lessons should we learn from what has happened? Um, we're not, I think, going to predict what's going to happen to interest rates next, because I have a strong suspicion that the only people who could tell us about that uh, uh, with any confidence here are not going to tell us. So, <laughs> so uh, I, one thing I've learned is, uh, as, uh, as, a, as a journalist is you don't ask a practising central go bank governor when he, when he or she is going to raise or lower rates. Um, doesn't It's fruitful. So we'll focus mostly on that, and then... We will look at, uh, having looked at the lessons of this episode, um, we will then look at, probably relatively brief, briefly, about whether, beyond what this teaches us for m the operation of monetary policy, we will look at whether central banks should be given other mandates or have other objectives. And there's in particular focus and it's very appropriate in this context that Mark is here, on the climate mandate. And should there be, an, or if not a mandate, how should it be taken into account? But there may be some other issues that we will want to address. So uh, let's start then with um, the lessons from this episode, uh, um, which has been very, I'm the most significant inflation episode, I would say, uh, since the late 70s, early 80s, uh, globally. And so, mm -hmm. and it was certainly not expected, but of course we had extraordinary shocks. COVID, um, the post-COVID recovery, two wars. Mm -hmm. um, so what do we learn from this episode? Is it basically nothing could have been done to prevent it? It was just one of those things and they're doing a, a magnificent job of bringing it under control or actually were there some serious policy mistakes we should be thinking about? What do you think, Thomas Jordan? Well, I think the regime, the policy regimes or the policy frameworks are OK, they are good. It was probably more a difficulty to make the right analysis. So what was permanent, what was transitory? I think there was a certain mistake at the beginning. Our monetary policy framework served us quite well. We could react relatively early and could maintain inflation at a very low level. Now, looking forward, I believe what is really important is having a forward-looking approach, not looking at the actual inflation, really having a forward-looking approach. 
low inflation is not really bad. It's much better than having high inflation. I think we have also to be humble about our capability to forecast. So we have to review these forecasts all the time, take into account also structural changes. And in my view, what is very important to have a risk management approach. So I think it's much better to take uh, decisions that are robust for a wider variety of different outcomes, rather than to choose one particular policy that may be the best, but only in one particular scenario. So I think risk management approach in the future is very important to, to focus on price stability and not to go into, let's say, extreme optimism, uh, optimization for monetary policy. Can I just follow up with one question which many will ask and mm. very interested in your views is, you said, which is what I would expect you in particular, the Swiss National Bank to say, low inflation is not really too bad. Mm. Do you, th one of the critiques people would make is that before the shock, uh, in, the, in the teens, um, a number of major central banks, notably the Fed, but also the Bank of England mm -hmm. and the uh, ECB, worked very, very hard. And now the Japanese Bank of Japan is working even harder to get inflation up because they do think it's bad. And in the process, they did enormous monetary expansion, at least expansion of the monetary base. Do you think that was a mistake? Well, I cannot really speak for the others, but in our case, I think it was extremely helpful to have a more flexible approach, that you can say everything that is below 2% but positive is an acceptable level. So we did not have to go into extreme monetary policy uh, decisions. So, so sometimes it's extremely difficult to bring inflation from one point to 2% uh, points, uh, and, and everything else is functioning very well. So I think we can maintain normal monetary policy, even if inflation is for some time uh, below uh, two percent, but above zero. No, oh, of course, yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. It has to you're, be you're, yeah. You're, yeah. Yeah. So, and that, of course, was the problem for the Jap Japan, which we must be clear about. Julio, uh, if I may address you, so, what is your view of the lessons of this experience, uh, and um, <coughs> and why it happened, and what we should learn from it? Well, first, probably one lesson is that there was overconfidence that inflation has been conquered, the great of the 90s and the effects of the Lehman crisis made inflation very low, and even this worry that we were mentioning about the ECB, Bank of England, the Fed. Uh, I also uh, believe be, 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 there was a supply shock, but it has disappeared. There was also a too expansionary fiscal policy, but also monetary policy was too expansionary, and the effects were not so visible at first. In a case, we started increasing the rate in, from zero, 0 0.25, we increased in August 2021, as soon as inflation was exceeding our target. But even at then, when Powell was saying, the same man when Powell was saying it was transitory, even at that time, we were not so sure that it was going to last a long time. Even the first two months of 2022, before the invasion of Ukraine, inflation was a little more than 2% annually. So it seemed that it was just an episode that you should just normalize the monetary interest rate. And then happen in Ukraine, with this so much liquidity in the system, you couldn't fight this increase in prices so rapidly. We have increased the interest rate all the months after, after, until January of, two, of 2022. And we have started a reduction of interest rate in September, five, five reductions already in September last year. But I, I, I believe that it's very hard. You knew it was a supply shock in a great measure. You cannot apply a strong monetary brace because we look at some recession. So the only way was increasing your interest rate month after month, trying to stop this, no? And now I believe that inflation is on its way back around the world. And probably we are get, going to get there. Some countries might reach in 2025. In our case, our core is now within the target. And we expect headline to be within the target in the next two months. So we are pretty well. But, um, it, 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 is, it, is, it is a process, and I believe it has to do something with Thomas was insinuating, in part. 
credibility for the central banks that you are going to react and inflation is going to be higher. It's not only the effect on the interest rate on, on demand, it's the credibility that the central bank will continue pushing rates until inflation is controlled. So I believe that affects in part the reaction of the markets. No? So let me make sure I sure. get the numbers right. You said you've had five reductions in interest rates? Uh, yeah, it started in September. Uh, actually, just to finish, we were the first country in the world to start inflation targeting with negative inflation in 2001. The second was Japan with Kuro in 2014. <laughs> no? So we had episodes of very low inflation, but we are not Switzerland, of course. <laughs> and when did you first raise rates? Uh, September of last year. This is, uh, we have monthly meetings. So the last increase was this month. I'm a little bit puzzled. It's, it's good, no, when we re reduce increases, excuse me. No, no. You, you've been, if I understand it, you've lowered them five times yeah, since last yes. September. When, before that, did you first increase them? Uh, uh, August 2021. So and you were ahead of, all as mass. you said, you were ahead of the, yes, all yes, the major yes, Western yes, banks yes, yes, yes. by many uh, months. I believe Latin America and Eastern Europe were the first to hike. No? OK, that's very, very helpful. Just so, so the audience understands this clearly. Laura. So first, let, let me clarify, I'm, I'm not a central banker. Um, and I, I want... You are, you are married to a former central banker. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, I want to be <laughs> humble, because as they say in Latin America, it's not the same to see her coming than to dance with her. No lo mismo verla venir que bailar con ella. Meaning, it is very easy for me outside to be more critical. Um, and let me take a, a perhaps a more academic view. I, I think we're going to go back, and we're going to see big shocks. And we're going to say, yes, government spending had to go up. Uh, we will disagree on the quantity, not on the, on the direction. <coughs> I do think there was a little bit more than was needed, especially in certain countries. Then we needed monetary policy. Some countries saw the concerns early because they saw the effects early, but also they were more sensitive to the effects. To your point, in Latin America, we have it very clear, inflation is a very regressive tax. Mm -hmm. In Latin America, our history of income inequality and poverty is also a history of very high inflation. And thus, I think that is why many countries in Latin America, at the early signs, acted, because it's our poor people, the one who pay inflation. Exposed, it's interesting that we have seen a very quick reduction in many countries. I don't think we're going to take it as the regime didn't work. I, as of right now, if you try to explain the reduction in inflation on the usual suspects, inflation expectations which have been anchored, labor supply and disruptions in supply chain, we probably won't be able to explain it. That means there was some productivity change. And again, it's possible that is AI, although I don't think we see the effects just yet. It's possible it's some home work, Zoom, logistics. But I think exposed is going to look a lot like the 90s, that we managed to bring it down very quickly because of some productivity that is hard to measure. In the 90s, it was computers, Walmart logistics. Now it's going to be some mixture of Zoom, AI logistics. But I think exposed, we're going to see it, it worked. There were some deviations we cannot explain, but on average, the regime worked. And are you, when you say that, you're thinking that specifically in the Latin American context or more broadly? I think more broadly, they, people would say some acted first, some acted later. Maybe they should have acted early on. But I think in hindsight, we're going to say the tools worked. OK. And I think you've stressed one very important point, which actually surprised me a bit, I, I, but, um, which is inflation expectations seem to have been remained rather well anchored. <clears throat> I actually have to say that I find that very surprising because uh, it's a huge price level shock. Uh, but the, but it, that's, it does seem to me incredibly important and it is a very significant issue. So um, let me now um, uh, turn to you, Catherine. What is the, how does the private sector feel about uh, this mess? Sorry, um, <laughs> this, <laughs> this transitory shock. Well, thank you very much, Martin. Well, I, yes, I'm always rather nervous of being on a, par on a panel with Mark. Um, and I'm very glad that you started off by suggesting we don't get into the topic of short-term interest rates, because 
I think um, my perspective is that we've got to dispense with the obsession of the short term. Uh, and the reality is that, you know, the short term framing around topics such as this is distinctly unhelpful um, for what we need to tackle in the world today. And as we all know, monetary policy is also an imperfect tool. So the, the perspective that the private sector brings to this is mostly what we want to see is a resilient financial system. And there is no doubt that the short term obsession with some of these topics is at, frankly, complete odds with the long term investments that we have to make in areas of whether it's climate change, or the whole transition uh, that we need to see in the energy space and more and more. And I, I think we'll probably come back to that in the second part of, of your panel. But I also think that one of the lessons that we've learned through this whole cycle, Martin, is that organizations need to be much better at stress testing. Um, a yes, in part, that was a mandate from the central banks, and that has been helpful. But as a long term investor, one of the things that we're really looking at is have organizations embedded more robust scenario analysis, stress testing into their corporate DNAs, because ultimately they will then be much more successful in the long term. So um, I think, as I said, um, you know, the private sector, generally speaking, likes to invest on a long term basis. And when you think about some of the of the challenges that we're, we're tackling today, whether it's healthcare, whether it's the climate space, you know, everything that's going on in AI. One of the things that gives me great hope is that in a post pandemic environment, we've learned to move faster. Um, uh, you know, one of the conversations we, we sort of had had sort of previously is, do we return to a pre a pre COVID environment? And personally, I really hope we don't. Because if you think about the transformative things that we've got much better and faster at since collaboration, generative AI, really tackling some of the big issues in the world. Um, I think you have to be full of hope, but I reiterate that we've got to focus on the long term. Do you think, just a little wrinkle on that, and I've been thinking about this, you talked about stress testing and stress testing yourself um, as a business, not impose, it would seem very, and I'd be interested in what that, what's happening. All these shocks of the last few years, and um, leave aside the financial crisis itself, would it seem to me have automatically forced business leaders to consider the risks and therefore to stress test themselves? Whether that makes them more long term, I'm not clear, but it might make them much more aware of the environment in which they might be operating. Do you think that's true? I think it, I think it is true. Um, I mean, obviously, I represent a bank and asset management business, so I would say categorically in our case. I mean, we were doing much of this before uh, the, the, the bank, you know, the central banks mandated this. But, um, you know, ultimately, it creates more resilience and, and, you know, it forces us to really understand what is happening in the macro context. And frankly, it's not just climate change that's causing shocks in the system. We have geopolitics, we have conflicts everywhere. We have an uncertain um, political you know, situation over the next two years. So I think if you don't come back to where you started, if you don't deploy effective risk management across your business, you are missing a major trick. So, Mark, um, <laughs> what is your assessment of the uh, the transitory blip, stroke, colossal mis mistake. Uh, what do we take away from it, above all, in terms of what we must continue to do and what we need to change? Okay. Uh, well, first, uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you, Catherine especially. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, I guess I, I'll put it in uh, maybe the following framing, which is that uh, for a long period up until, <laughs> including post-financial crisis, really up until the COVID shock, most central banks, not all, but most central banks, certainly in the G7, were operating in a world of what's called divine coincidence, uh, at least in central bank parlance. In other words, inflation was below target and the economy were, their economies were operating below potential. So to the extent to which they thought about a dual mandate, either formally in the US or uh, getting the economy back to potential as a means to have inflation at target, both sides said one thing, stimulate. And the question was calibrating that stimulus and making sure that it was in the right direction. Okay. That is not the case when you have a supply shock. When you have a supply shock, as has been 
painfully uh, demonstrated, you have to make trade-offs. And if you're a, an inflation targeter, you have to decide to the extent you can as a central bank, and there's limits to your power, of course, the horizon over which you try to bring inflation back to target. That's the flexibility in inflation targeting. Um, if it's a one-off oil price shock, for example, you look through it. But central banks were not faced with one-off supply shocks. They were faced with, like London buses, a series of supply shocks that showed up at the same time. And I uh, very much uh, uh, re-emphasize one of the points that Julio made, which, and the Ukraine shock on the energy side and the knock-on effect of that on top of existing shocks that were coming out of COVID are significant. Now, um, we had this theoretical experience, or more than theoretical experience, uh, at the Bank of England uh, when we looked at Brexit. And this is in the public record because our scenario analysis was pulled out uh, from us by Parliament. Uh, we viewed that it was a supply shock, uh, which it has proved to be. Um, and the consequence of that would be the economy would slow, the exchange rate would go down, inflation would go up, and the Bank of England would have to tighten interest rates. Mm. And that's exactly what happened. At the time that that was released, apart from my central banking colleagues in private, nobody uh, I wouldn't say, I shouldn't say nobody. Very few people recognize that as a credible scenario. That's how long the world had gone, you referenced the 70s, without a major supply shock that had some endurance. Next point and I'll, I'll finish up. Which is, so how has inflation come down? It's come down, and it hasn't come down, I'll, I'll, if, if I may, the job is not complete. Uh, nobody's suggesting uh, that it's complete, but progress has been made. And it's come down for two broad reasons. One, part of those supply shocks have unwound, particularly with respect to, obviously, COVID-induced issues with supply chains, challenges in the goods market, some recovery in labor markets as people have themselves gone back into the labor market. Um, uh, the energy price shock, of course, it can reemerge, but flows through. And then, crucially, the actions of the central banks in acting to tighten have moderated demand mm -hmm. such that there is a greater prospect of demand and supply being in balance. Um, so that's, that's the overall uh, aspect. And the last point I just make is that the lesson I, I, I would take from this is the strength of the regime. The, you know, the regi it, it, there's issues of execution you, and, and, and the degree of difficulty that uh, my, my, my peers, uh, at, at, uh, former peers, I guess, um, uh, have had to deal with. Um, but the strength of the regime, uh, flexibility, crucial importance, point Catherine made, of macro prudential, of having a resilient financial system so the financial system itself can deal with these shocks. And I think you have to give very high marks uh, to the central banks and other authorities because the system made it through those shocks. But the last point is that we are in a world, I would suggest, where we're going to see additional supply shocks with some relatively high degree of certainty, with some persistence. And just to finish on that, which is, uh, you know, we're effectively the world is being rewired. Uh, our trade routes are being rewired through uh, de-risking of, of supply chains. That is a form of a supply shock. It will have some persistence. Obviously, energy systems are being rewired uh, with uh, addressing uh, climate change. And so those are both, for a period, have some headwinds, uh, ultimately could bring greater resilience, and moving in the other direction, and I think it's very early days, so I don't think it's showing up um, in supply today, uh, but we have the rewiring of intelligence um, and the positive supply shock that will come, I suspect, and others uh, here in uh, Davos are better placed to uh, comment on this and affect it, I suspect we don't start to see that until later in this decade, uh, but then central banks will be grappling, grappling with headwinds and tailwinds, if you will, on supply, on top of their usual responsibilities uh, of managing demand and a resilient financial system. Let me just ask one follow-up question of the two central bankers, others may intervene. Towards, just before the crisis, a number of central banks, uh, not, I think, the Bank of England, but certainly the Fed and the ECB, were giving, indicating or explicitly shifting their regime in a way to be more backward looking. In, in other words, to say that oh, yes. if we have failed to hit the target for a long time, 
that means we're not where we should be cumulatively. And in that situation, we ought to wait longer to react. And we're committing ourselves yep. to wait longer to react. And they sort of announced this pretty well, if my memory is 2019. I may have got the... Uh, it would, let's say, I let's say there, thereabouts. But thereabouts. just in the run into... It, it, the timing wasn't optimal. The timing wasn't optimal. Let's put it Do that you way. think that way of looking at things was one of the reasons yes. they didn't recognise that if you've got a significant supply shock, well, that sort of means you're likely to have excess demand. Uh, right, as you pointed out. I, and therefore, you should start thinking I, about what that means for your monetary policy. I think it's fair to say, with the full wisdom of hindsight, okay. uh, that the, uh, the, Fed's, the Fed felt its hands were tied for a longer period of time because of that regime, the flexible average inflation targeting regime, uh, and that they had added to that regime a series of other conditions uh, that, that in terms of sequencing of the changing in policy as well, and actually specific outcomes in the labor market above and beyond just the uh, level of nominal GDP uh, that meant that they, uh, they waited too long. And I think they would, well, I won't. What do you think about this? I mean, in a way, it seems to me one of the big episode lessons of this is you have to be consistently forward-looking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. and, uh, and that, I think, consistent very much with what you said at the beginning. Is that one of the important conclusions? Well, for me, yes. I think forward-looking is absolutely necessary. Although I believe, I think, the, the, the very difficulty was given these supply shocks and the war, the disentangling between what, what is uh, permanent and what is transitory. And there, the views were very different at the beginning. And that was maybe independent of whether it was forward-looking or backward-looking. But in general, I said at the beginning, I think it's very necessary to be forward-looking. But uh, Mark said it before, that the uncertainty about what happens in the future is also very big. So uh, we have always to review our forecasts and then to adjust again. So the uncertainty is very big and we have to find a way to make robust decisions within this very uncertain environment. Would you add anything on that? Yes, I believe it has to be forward-looking, but the vision of the future is tinted by what you have seen in the past. Mm -hmm. That not existed of shocks since the 70s, the low inflation for almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. Even what we saw before Lehman, the confidence in many policymakers in the States that the cycle was conquered, that it was not going to be a recession. Mm -hmm. So it, mm -hmm. it's true, you have to be forward-looking, but your forward-looking vision is affected by what had been happening in the recent years. No? Mm. Yeah. Can I perhaps I think I've been thinking about one final question, then we'll go on. But um, then want to go particularly to the, some of the, the, the some of these other issues. But um, the uh, we um, we um, essentially decided that uh, um, uh, um, after the financial crisis that we needed to change our whole approach to financial regulation in a pretty big way. It was a big, it was a big failure. What I'm hearing here is the view that, yes, it was an inflationary upsurge because of unexpected supply shocks. There were some parts of the way they were approaching the mandate, their mandate before, which probably a bit too backward looking. But the essence of the regime um, the, uh, what turned out to continue to be relatively flexible labour markets, that's quite important, so that's, oh, that's up. other policies. Yeah. The, the, the inflation expectations reigned quite remarkably well anchored, despite a big shock. Um, it looks as though we have a very good chance of getting out of it, though we don't know how quickly, that actually we can say that after this shock, unlike the financial shock, there isn't actually any real re need to change the way central banks handle monetary policy. Is that your view? Again, there's a lot of heterogeneity and a lot of regimes. Um, I once was in a, in a meeting <coughs> where an important policymaker was saying, oh, the problems with deflation. 
And this was a speech that was given in Brazil. <laughs> and everyone in Brazil was like, deflation. <laughs> so, so again, uh, some of these views... They're that... very short memories. <laughs> <laughs> some of these views of we really had a problems with getting inflation up and we're more of the North than many other countries. I think that probably helped them in thinking, well, we need to react. Um, but in terms of the tools, I think in hindsight, we will say the regime worked. I, again, I, I, I am a fan of inflation targeting because it does give you flexibility. You don't need to get the target today. You can get it in. And I think that worked. And so going to these grand visions of changing monetary policy, I, I actually don't think we need them. I think getting inflation right is not easy. Getting whether it's a permanent, transitory, it's a supply shock or demand shock is not easy. I think getting inflation to the right number is extremely important. Again, I think some of the deviations is not everyone thinks how regressive it can be. I think many countries... Clearly, you can see it in the politics. Exactly. I, I, I do, I'm of the view the poor people pay it, so we shouldn't deviate from a 2% target and so on. And thus, I would maintain it. Like, it's not easy to get the number right. Let's not complicate it, and let's try to work towards getting the number right. So one final little thing here, I think, and then I want to go into these other issues. But Thomas said, um, which I thought was pretty important, that you should be pretty relaxed between zero and two, which means, by implication, um, but you might you might be at zero and and be relaxed about it, and of course it might suddenly be meant negative. Would you take the same view um, about? And this is a really big controversy now, as you know. Lots of people, <laughs> I've spent years fighting them, uh, say, well, when it went down to less in Britain actually than elsewhere, but. Yeah. When it went well below target for long periods, the effort to push it up with all that it meant, yeah. QE noise, was just a huge mistake and a huge distortion. And we're suffering from that in part, if not in the inflation, at least in excess debt and all the rest of it. So Thomas is right. We sh this is what we should have done. Uh, well, first thing, it's always good to look at the numbers and inflation average just under 2% in the, in the UK. Not in the UK. Yeah, so I, if I that. could speak I for, UK yeah, for that. UK actually hit its target. Yes. Thank well you. Done. Thank you. Thank you. Can we, can we memorialize that? This is, um, We're better at inflation in some countries. <laughs> we are okay at inflation. We just got it under control. The, um, this, but the, what's critical in it, look, yes, the flexibility should be used on both sides, first point particularly if you have situations where you have good disinflation. In other words, you have, let's, let's, let's pretend we're in 2028, 20, 2029, 20, we're all invited back and we're here, and we have this productivity uh, a dividend that's coming from AI and from the net zero transition, which does give a productivity dividend uh, as, it, as it flows through. Um, and then we have lower, uh, lower price inflation. There is a pretty good, and we should be having a pretty robust debate at that point, about taking some of that in lower inflation, that supply benefit, stretch it using the flexibility to take longer to come back, uh, and making sure that we have robust. Uh, and, and, and regardless of whether we do that, I, I, I would say one of the lessons of the productivity boom in the early 2000s and the response to that is that might have been a better uh, policy and in, in, the late in, the, in the U.S. late 90s, in, in the run-up to the sub, yeah. what turned out to be the run-up to the subprime uh, crisis. Um, but we can have a broader discussion. We don't have time for but the and then the second point I just want to emphasize though is that it is and, and it picks up on something Catherine and actually everyone has touched on is I think the re regimes that will perform better in the next few years are the ones that were very uh, robust during the pre-COVID period on the health of their financial systems and thinking about their mortgage markets and thinking about indebtedness. And, and so those who put in place uh, basically restrictions so that you couldn't take out a mortgage, even though bank rate was 1%, unless you could uh, service it at 5 or 6%, uh, those types of macroprudential measures, which weren't hugely popular, but now are incredibly relevant. Um, and that means the system, uh, the financial system uh, functions better. Last point, if I may, which is that this thing on stress testing, it's 
it's very hard to stress for the crisis that actually happens. Sure. You know, plans are useless, but planning is essential, that Eisenhower uh, line. <laughs> but planning for failure makes the financial institution more robust for what, what does actually happen. Uh, and that's why there's huge value to this in good times for the bad. Let's just talk briefly about the mandate. Um, I don't think we're going to get time with, uh, to, to go to questions from the audience. I apologize, but I think that was inevitable. Um, so I'll start with you, Catherine. Um, if you were in charge, to charge to the Exchequer in the, the case, you could change the man, you could change the, the mandate of the Bank of England without any difference. It doesn't need any legislation or any of that messy stuff. Um, so would you um, add in climate or some other considerations as a mandate? Or do, and if not, how would you incorporate it in risk management in the bank, of, in, the, in the bank, in its financial ma sector management? Um, what do you think? Well, I don't envy their task for a, for a start. Um, and we obviously have some, some far more qualified people on the panel. But um, what I would say is that I'm full of hope that across the financial service sector and actually across the economy as a whole, there is far greater awareness of sustainability factors um, in, in planning for the future. And we obviously had um, a huge lead globally taken by the Bank of England, um, you know, under Mark's leadership. And it's, you know, it wasn't just a good idea, people are actually doing it. Yeah. Um, the, the other hat I wear, in addition to my GIB hat, is I also chair CDP, which is the Carbon Disclosure Project, through which uh, organizations around the world disclose their, uh, their, their um, climate-related um, financial disclosures. And the really important thing is, is that the numbers are rising exponentially. So it isn't something that people are necessarily doing just because they're told to, because it makes a difference in terms of how their investors perceive the value of that organization. So it then becomes a really um, you know, self-fulfilling circle. But I think, you know, the second point I would make um, and then sort of obviously make time for others is that I don't think it's just the mandate of central banks to tackle climate change. Um, I think that's um, far too naive. <coughs> I think it is the role of governments. Um, I think it's the role of the private sector. And frankly, it's also the role of consumers. Um, I think if, if we're not aware, if we're not having these conversations with our children, um, again, I think we're living in a, in a cave um, and there are huge issues to tackle. Um, if you um, simply look at some of the um, uh, climate-related disclosures that we see through TCFD, um, financial institutions are holding around $9 trillion of fossil fuel assets on their balance sheets. Um, we are going to have a big stranded asset problem, uh, and we will need to work through this. So if we don't do it together and come back to the earlier point I made around um, this sort of post sort of in the, in the eye of the storm and the pandemic and post-pandemic view of cooperation and collaboration, I just don't think we have a hope, but I am full of hope because I think we can do it. But the key point you're making here is this is a systems problem and it's not a bank of, a central bank problem as such. It has to look at this, but it's not the main actor. Um, sometimes every so often you, people seem to believe that somehow because it's got all this money and monetary power and you don't actually have to legislate anything, it just can fix it. And I think it's helpful to understand that it can't. Do you um, have any views on changes of the mandate of the central bank? This is one, but the other one that is much discussed, and I know you have about 40 seconds for this, uh, is uh, should we raise the inflation target? OK, that's great. Right. <laughs> Beautiful. <Yes. laughs> but also, let me add something. I, I think sometimes we forget we're here an elite. There's some people that do not know what they're going to eat tomorrow. And so for them, the discussion with their kids, I honestly think it should be, what am I going to feed you tomorrow? Am I going to send you to school? Mm. And, and sometimes we take that for granted. No. Maybe they're not the ones who should be thinking about these grand topics. And, and I just say it because, again, I, I do think we have a bias here and, and we forget that there are many people that is, what am I going to feed my, my kid tomorrow? And that is their, their priority. And thus, again, inflation is very regressive. And so we want to get it right. Climate affects prices and many central banks have already incorporated that. The Brazilian central bank does consider what is going to feed the effect of El Nino, La Nina, 
on agriculture, on a price. So it's already there because it is affecting the final price. And I think that's the way to do it and not directly. Beautifully pointed. Julio, the mandates are perfect or should we change them? No, I, 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 I really think that most of the emerging market countries in fish already have probably a range in a way one to three. First, weather factor will affect volatility. So yeah. if particularly poor country where the weight of food is higher in the CPA, yeah. we have more volatility. But also probably, uh, although you will have benefits at the end, in the transition, probably there will be a pressure on prices, as you insinuated, Laura, no? So probably part of inflation might be somewhat higher than your target for some time. And it's good not to put a pressure to that, but that same that for a time will be 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, no? And not be obsessed with the number. What people want is lower stable inflation. They don't know, they don't care if there's 2.2 or 2.1 or 2, no? Mark, what do you think about the, um, the mandate? Uh, I, well, I wouldn't change the target, so I, I agree with the professor. Um, I, I, th I think it's served well, first point. Secondly, I think the principal role of central banks with respect to climate uh, is with respect to the resilience of individual financial uh, institutions and, and the system as a whole. And if I could put it this way, normally what you're doing... And this is a financial regulation. It's a problem. financial it's regulatory, yeah. And, 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 and so there's many central banks that don't actually have a financial regulatory responsibility, therefore it doesn't fall for them. Um, but, uh, you know, in general, in financial stability, this is my last point, which is you, you need to plan for failure. Uh, right. So you think of, you know, there's a COVID shock, uh, uh, there's, you know, some bad thing happens, a big financial institution fails. So I plan for failure, think about how we keep the system functioning so those who are least well off are not hurt. It's, it's, it is unforgivable to have the problems of the financial system fall on the most vulnerable in society. With respect to climate, one of the key things you're planning for in stress testing mm -hmm. is success. Society decides in the UK, in Canada, many other places, but in UK and Canada, it's the law of the land to get to net zero by 2050. So the question that's asked is, well, what if we actually do that? What if companies change their energy mix? They get their emissions down. What's your exposure? Where's, where are your problems on your balance sheet? Where are your uh, assets on your balance sheet? How does that move? Have you thought it through? Uh, and, that's, and that's a critical aspect that just helps to support the smoothing of that transition whatever society actually implements. Last word for you Well, I'm on the mandate. I'm convinced that it's very important to maintain a very narrow mandate. Uh, we can ju only justify central bank independence by having a narrow mandate, price stability, supporting the economy. And central bank independence is really a key success factor for, uh, for a monetary policy. It's also important to see that we do not really have effective and efficient instrument to tackle climate change. So our main contribution is really a stable economic environment and then parliament and government can take their responsibility and take the appropriate measure. So I think a narrow mandate is really, I think uh, for everybody the best we can have and we can justify independence. Thank you very much. Well, I have 18 seconds to sum up. <laughs> and uh, it actually seems fairly clear, which in a way is almost disappointing. People agree so much. But the, uh, <laughs> but the basic conclusion here is um, the flexible inflation targeting framework, which has become the norm, has worked reasonably well, uh, in, despite some really big shocks. Uh, and we can always, they're obviously they're all going to have to go back and look at whether they did the forecasting properly and all the rest of it and learn from it. But inflation expectations were well anchored. We haven't needed the huge, apparently, the huge increases in unemployment that, for instance, my friend Larry Summers thought would be yeah. necessary. That's an enormous policy achievement, which I hadn't expected. Uh, there's a good chance that they, we will get back onto target. Um, um, in the next year or two, it's going to be pretty difficult to exit from policy. We didn't go into that, but that's clearly true. Uh, and uh, and uh, the world is massively uncertain, and we've just been reminded of that. To some degree, the central bankers were well, not basically they couldn't have avoided this, and we should preserve them um, as well as uh, basically the regime as firmly and as, as well as. We can, uh, but of course there are huge other economic and social problems.
Um, and the central banks have to play a part in this, and the most obvious way they play a part in this is making sure that the financial risks associated with them are fully internalised within the system. And otherwise, I'm afraid the, the, the solutions will lie in the hands of politics and private business and us all. Um, I think that's very much the sense, and the hope that somehow we can hand it over to the central banks to fix is a delusion. And there are a few people who do actually seem to think that. Um, I think they've done a wonderful job and it's been a very enjoyable discussion. I'm sorry there wasn't time for Q&A, but Such with, is like. with five panellists and uh, 45 minutes, it was never going to happen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.